Hello, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and I just want to give you a perspective on urge surfing to help your clients overcome destructive urges. Now the American philosopher Rolf Waldo Emerson said, we gain the strength of the temptations we resist. And I think that's a really interesting take on the power of overcoming temptations. When we overcome personal temptations, we don't just become uh, more resilient, we actually become strengthened by the repeated overcoming of that temptation or urge. By giving up certain things, we gain certain other things. And the things we gain by giving up can be immense in terms of personal development and growth. So I recently saw a young client I'll call Ray, and he said of his gambling addiction that the urge to gamble came over him like a huge wave and then he would lose himself underneath or inside this urge to gamble. His impulsive machine gaming was stealing so much from him. It was depriving his child of resources. It was threatening to end his new marriage and it was stripping his self-respect and the respect other people had of it. Now, of course, strong urges can drag us all off course sometimes, you know, impulses, uh, desires can lead us around by the nose, causing us to live life as a kind of bloated bag of unruly appetites if we're not careful. That's when we start feeling really out of control. So what can we do about them? As I've said, catastrophic impulsivity can lay waste to whole lives. And yet if we can just wait a little, the seemingly overwhelming urge to um, blow out on drink or drugs or food or spend money uncontrollably or blow up in a fiery ball of rage will, like dew on a summer morning, evaporate fast. If we can ride out and surf the crest of the temptation without being plunged beneath its crushing wave, we'll keep ourselves safe from the urge. Urge surfing means just that, you know, rather than sinking or fighting the urge, we surf the wave of the impulse until the wave has lost its force, its power. The urge passes and we find we didn't drown after all, and we let it go. But how can we help our clients to do this? Well, firstly, we can reassure them of something important. Swimming against the tide is never easy. Trying not to do something can be really tough. Importantly, urge surfing isn't about fighting the urge any more than you fight the clouds when you just watch them floating by above you. Letting the urge be there rather than trying to suppress it is key to the technique of urge surfing. We use urge surfing to help clients manage their own unwanted behaviors by not giving in to destructive urges, but rather riding them out like a surfer just riding a wave. What's more, the more able a client becomes to urge surf destructive impulses and compulsions, not deny them, but not give in to them either, the healthier and happier their life becomes as a whole. So how might we develop this skill of urge surfing in our clients? Well, here's a few ideas um, that I find useful that you might as well. So tip number one, we can externalize the pattern. So uh, as a metaphor, imagine a parasite that nests within inside somebody, then insidiously convinces that person that somehow they are who that person essentially is. So this external parasite comes inside a person and starts to pretend to be the person. The more a client identifies with the urge, the harder it may be to detach from it and let it pass. You know, for example, when people say things like, um, uh, I'm a smoker, or I'm a depressive, or I have an addictive personality, they're describing how they've enmeshed their very identity, their core identity, with the problem pattern, as if there's no separation. We want our clients to externalize the destructive pattern because when they do that, they become more easily um, able to start to detach from the destructive pattern and, and leave it behind. So how do we do this? Well, firstly, my tip number one, 
we can begin to frame the problem as external to the person through the way that we describe the problem. And we can do this with our questioning as well. So we could use questions like, um, uh, how does that bulimia try to con you into believing it's somehow going to help you? How will you stand up to that smoking when it tries to con you back again? What kinds of lies will it try to use on you to convince you it's a good idea to go back with it? How do those depressive biased thinking styles make you buy into them? So we're externalizing the pattern by the way we're framing it when we need the client to understand or what we need the client to understand rather is that the problem is not who they essentially are. They, the essential them, are not the problem. It's an imposter to their being, an unwelcome house guest, which can leave and leave for good. So we don't have to say that as a cliche or platitude, you know, you are not the problem, but rather demonstrate it to them in the way that we ask about and discuss the problem with them. So by externalizing the pattern, we also reframe it. You know, when the client begins to talk about the pattern as external to themselves, they're already starting to transcend it and it becomes easier for them to feel separate from it. A useful technique in this regard is mindfulness. You know, mindfulness entails a sense of being outside of our thoughts and feelings and sensations. So by practicing mindfulness, your client can develop their observing self, which will further enhance a sense of distance between themselves and their problem behavior, be it gambling or drinking or whatever it happens to be. Finding this sense of distance can also guide our clients towards a greater sense of self-compassion, which is likely to boost motivation and resilience. And indeed, research found that self-compassion following dieting setbacks may help maintain motivation and promote healthier responses. So as far as dieting was concerned, self-compassion um, enabled the dieters to stick to the diet more easily. Next, we need to develop a plan and strategy for our clients to surf that urge in the moment. So tip number two is help your client stay in touch with wider values or their wider values. So it's important to remember that urges are hypnotic. And by that, I mean they narrow our focus of attention right down and everything else is forgotten in the moment. And often they, are, they arise in association with other post-hypnotic triggers, which cause the urge to arise within us. So strong urges snap metaphorical fingers. They mesmerize us into forgetting all but what the urge nudges or bullies us into doing. We forget in the moment that the urge, if it is a destructive one, will come at a great price as we betray what we truly value. But what if we can remember, not just intellectually, but feeling-wise, our true best interest when the urge tries to push us around? We can help our clients urge surf by encouraging them to identify their core values and goals and explore how their urges may be interfering with these values. Then, when the urge tries to manipulate them into casting aside their best interests and their values, then they'll be prepared to consciously stay in touch with their values and true wider wishes. The opposite of trance is a wide context and we want the client to have a wide context when the urge comes knocking at the door. So equipped with this sense of purpose and meaning, clients can find the motivation to tolerate discomfort and resist impulsive actions. And in fact, research has shown that stating or affirming aloud core values when tempted to give in to an urge can enhance our ability to surf the urge and mindfully watch it pass without giving into it. So we're affirming our, prin our principles, our um, ethics and so on, you know, what we really true, truly believe in the moment of temptation. So you might elicit from your clients some of their core values ahead of time, such as um, honesty or health or self-improvement or sobriety or self-control or whatever it happens to be then have them rehearse stating these core values out loud when they feel the urge coming on. Ray, the young uh, gaming machine gambler, said he believed his responsibilities were important. He had a young family uh, and a new marriage. 
So I had him close his eyes and approximate the urge, then open his eyes and state aloud, my responsibilities are important to me. This was his value. While enhancing motivation and self-control is an important facet of urge surfing, for some clients it isn't enough on its own. This next strategy powerfully interferes with the mechanics of the urge itself. So tip number three is scramble the urge. When helping our clients develop urge surfing, it's vital to help them spot when the urge is first building so that we can find a way to naturally transcend the urge, even derail it before it drags them along. So we're scrambling the pattern so it can't run along so mechanically anymore. So the urge needs to dance to our client's tune, not the other way around. Problems run in mechanical ways, and that may sound strange, but it's true. An urge or compulsion will have a predictable beginning, middle and end. The scrambling technique relies on identifying the steps of the urge, um, like this, for example. So step number one, we would be identifying a time when the urge would naturally be at its weakest or even non-existent. Okay, so ask your client, what is a state of mind furthest away from the urge state? It might be when they're relaxed in nature or some other relaxing or resourceful experience that they have. Or it might be after they've indulged in the urge for some time and it's played out to the point where it's exhausted, where they no longer want to engage in it. You know, they feel fed up, literally, possibly, with binging or disgusted with themselves after gambling and so on. Step two, identify the steps of the urge problem in order. So now ask them, what triggers the urge to kick in in those very first few moments? Maybe they feel the urge because they're aware it's a certain time of day, you know, wine o'clock, or maybe it's when they're in a particular place where gambling machines are located or any other trigger. Get them to close their eyes and access the feelings associated with that initial step, with that urge. Then ask, what happens next? You know, maybe it's fighting the urge, but then giving into it or justifying why it's okay in their mind to give in this time or you know, th this is the second step. Again, have them close their eyes and hypnotically access that step. Then move on to the third and fourth steps or however many different phases of the compulsion there are. Have the client close their eyes and access an approximation of each step in turn until finally they reach the end of the urge feelings, the point where the urge is finally exhausted. This is a powerfully important point. When we examine any compulsive activity, how, do the, how does the person know when to stop? Why don't they just binge forever or smoke 24 seven? How or why does the rage that they feel end? So this is the last step of the pattern. How does it stop? Once all the steps have been identified, have them go through the pattern in order of how it happens, opening and closing their eyes in between each step. Next comes the scrambling part. So step three, scramble the pattern. Have them access step one, the very initial stirrings of the urge, then immediately go to the sense of it ending, then go back to the very first step again, then interpolate the polar opposite state of mind they previously identified, go back and forth between the steps in a completely random order until the steps are so scrambled that it's near impossible to get the old urge pattern back anymore. So I did this with Ray, the compulsive um, gaming gambler, to the point where he couldn't even approximate an urge feeling at all anymore. Or if he did, the urge immediately died because we'd scrambled it so much and we'd associated it with a polar opposite feeling. So he lost the urge to gamble and it just went and we still had therapy to do, but the emergency, you know, hem hemorrhaging money had been stemmed. And of course, not every client will respond quite so dramatically to this technique. If they still need a bit more support handling their urges, the next step can be very helpful. So tip four, teach your client how to relax with those urges. Guide your clients through a mindful body scan where they can then um, use that technique when they experience intense urges. Encourage them to bring their attention to different parts of their body, noticing any tension or discomfort or sensations associated with that urge. By observing these bodily sensations without judgment, 
clients can learn to tolerate the urge without feeling overwhelmed by it. We can also teach our clients to anchor themselves in the present moment by focusing on their breath when urges arise. Invite them to notice the sensation of the breath entering and leaving their body without trying to change or control it. Just as the air we breathe isn't us, is not who we are, but rather passes through us, so too an urge isn't us, and we can simply watch the urge pass through us too. We can also use visualization techniques with our urge stricken clients. So tip five, help them ride the wave through visualization. Guiding your clients through metaphorical visualization exercises can help them develop a sense of mastery over their urges and build resilience in the face of temptation. So the better hypnotically trained you are, the more powerful, of course, this will be. I might help a client visualize themselves uh, surfing a wave, you know, with the wave representing, of course, the urge. I encourage them to visualize riding the wave with skill and confidence, staying balanced and focused despite its intensity. And we can encourage them to then visualize the wave getting smaller and smaller in future as more equilibrium returns to their life. We can also take a more direct approach with our visualization. Having our clients hypnotically rehearse experiencing the old trigger times, but finding that the urges, like voices that have become barely audible, no longer bother them. So these are by no means the only tools to use when helping our clients overcome their urges and compulsions, but they're powerful ones if you can master them. Ray told me that when it came to the urge to throw his family's money into a metal box, what had once been a storm was now barely a ripple. Music